found um, a notebook that I'd created, which goes up to a few days right before uh, my visit to Toronto. But it was a very strategic time in my life, and, I, and um, the meeting in Illinois for the vineyard that catapulted me to get invited to Toronto had just happened. It's, it's that night. I write about it. It's October 27, 1993. It's my thoughts, and it's some of my thoughts afterwards. And I thought I'd share them with you because you can read a lot in textbooks, but textbooks are kind of boring in the sense that you don't really get into what was going on in the person's life. So I'm just going to share it with you because I think it could be more interesting than reading it from a church history book one day. Uh, 90, October 27, 1993, on this day I began a journal because I felt God led me to do so. I've never journaled before in my life. I need to be pinched to make sure what happened tonight was real and not a dream. For me, it was like living a dream come true. I've always wanted to move in the power of God, to be able to pray for people and see God's power come on them. Tonight was awesome. It was like walking in another dimension. I only hope this, that this will not be a rare occasion, but that God will allow me to visit this dimension frequently. That would be heaven. The day began by getting in bed about 12.30 a.m. I'd been talking with people about the sovereign visitation of the Lord the preceding night. Especially, um, I was wide awake and I was supposed to pray for the night's meeting at which I was going to share what God was doing. I believe God wanted to touch the leadership, the pastors, and the wives of our region. I had an especially great concern for Fred Cullum, a vineyard missionary in Fresnello, California, Mexico. He appeared so beaten down after about 14 years of missionary work in Mexico, during which time he had planted about 12 churches. I was also led to pray for Happy Layman, our regional overseer for the Midwest Association of Vineyard Churches and also to pray for my associate pastor, Robert Stovall, for God to empower him with the power to impart power through the laying on of the hands. I was also praying in general for the Spirit to fall on the meeting. The great theme of the time of prayer was one sentence, Come, Holy Spirit. The time of prayer ended at 4 a.m. Again, this was not a pattern or even occasional experience for me. This was rare, to wake up and pray with such ease. This was a new experience. I felt led to pay attention to the clock, to note the time of prayer. I've been asking God to give me a sign which would indicate who I should begin to pray for in the ministry time, which would follow my team's sharing and the worship that night. I knew it would be very important to begin with the right people, that the people's faith would be stirred, I felt impressed to ask for those who had been awakened between 2 and 4 a.m. to pray for them. I didn't have the faith to be so precise when the time actually came, so I will never know if I heard so precisely those who woke up between 2 and 4. I would like to know if the people were awakened during that time, but I was too scared to say that. So instead, I said, anyone who woke up last night and in the middle of the night, you were praying that God would touch you, you're the ones that want to come forward. Around 5, I was again awakened and prayed a brief time, but soon fell back to sleep and slept until the alarm at 6.30. I asked Happy if he would allow John Raymer to share in the morning session. He agreed to give him five minutes. I knew he would take more, which he did. <laughs> After the morning session, we had the afternoon off. We went to the meeting area and prayed for the meeting for about two hours. I later found out that a whole group of intercessors at the St. Louis Vineyard, which is where I pastored, and my wife and I started the church, were committed to pray for the time of ministry, which was anticipated to be about 8.30 p.m. And there probably was about uh, 8 to 14 uh, people in the church praying at this, for this meeting. The meeting began at 7, and, some I, with, and after some icebreakers, the whole staff did Happy introduced me, giving our whole team 30 minutes to share. I knew we would take longer. 
I shared on the theme of those who are thirsty, drinking. From John 7, 37, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Revelation 21, 6, and Acts 2, 15. During the time of sharing, John Raymer was broken into sobs. As he sat in the back row, that was the summa cum laude graduate, one of our most brilliant tenured pastors who worked with Francis Schaeffer and Labrie in, in Switzerland, um, who now is the one on the back row just sobbing. You could hear him all over. He just uncontrollable sobbing. He was the one who touched the night before. As he said in the back, he must have wept for 20 minutes as we continued to share. It was obvious that the Holy Spirit was at work among the pastors and their wives. I shared for about 40 minutes telling the story of how God had come again into my ministry in a wonderful way, how he was touching people in my church and about how far I had fallen from the work in the spirit that had characterized my earlier ministry when I first got involved with Vineyard and how I'd repented of that for the church. Then Bill and Robin Mares, he was my children's pastor and he was with me. He's the other guy who spoke twice of the four days that I was scheduled to be in Toronto. Uh, he had been with me when Rodney Howard Brown prayed for me and prayed for him. Then Bill and Mar Robin Mares, who pastored youth and children at my church, shared what God was doing in them. They were followed by another pastor and wife who had experienced some of the same phenomena of the Spirit in their church that we had in, as we had had in ours on the same weekend. We shared a total of one and a half hours. Then worship began. Worship was usually 30 minutes long, but at the end of the third song, I felt it time to begin ministry. I stated that I wasn't sure whether or not I'd heard God, but was going to risk it and find out. I asked if there were persons present who had been awakened and had cried out to God to touch them last night. Eight to ten people indicated they had, been, they had had that. That had been their experience. I asked for them to come to the front of the, of the area for prayer that we were going to begin praying for this group. Bill, Robin, and Robert, my associate pastor, Bill is my assistant pastor, were helping me with the ministry team time. The first person I prayed for was a woman who came and stood right in front of me. She was very hurt, and nothing happened to her initially. Both Bill and I prayed for her. She later finally broke through and was touched by God about two hours later. However, the next people we prayed for fell quickly to the floor where some began to cry and others laughed and others just quietly were ministered to. Now, I need to point out that this falling to the floor thing at the time was very rare. It had been present like nine years earlier in much of the vineyard, but for the last five, six, eight years, it was just, matter of fact, my church was eight years old that I'd started it. It had never happened. Nobody had ever fallen under the power until a few weeks before when I came back from Rodney's uh, meeting. Uh, some began to cry, others laughed, and others were just quietly uh, were ministered to. We had been praying at our church that God would increase the anointing on us so that we would not have to pray with people so long for his power to fall upon them. This was an answer to prayer. <laughs> As I write this, I anticipate, now you have to remember, this is before Toronto. This is the first night. This is the night, the first time he touches anybody outside of my local church once I came back in August from Rodney's meeting in, in Tulsa. As I write this, I anticipate this may occur in my ministry in the future. <laughs> I mean, this is rare to get to hear something like this. But only time will tell if this was an isolated, sovereign incident or whether it will be the beginning of a ministry of revival for the church. The next two hours were like we stepped into another dimension. It was like living in a dream. I kept thinking to myself, I need someone to pinch me to know this is really happening. Some of the more notable incidents that are still deeply impressed upon my memory were in regard to Happy Layman, the regional overseer 
Fred Cullum, the missionary, John Raymond, the pastor of the Mundelein Vineyard in the northern suburbs of Chicago, Judy Wright and Donna Heinrich, whose husbands pastored the vineyards in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, in a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and my wife, Deanne. Um, Judy and Robert Wright, um, when they came into the vineyard, I'd, after the Spillertown event, uh, and then after I was asked to leave, uh, though I won the vote of confidence, we had a meeting in uh, October, I think it was August or October, of 84, and he was a pastor of a First Baptist Church in Southeast Missouri, and I can't think of the name of it right now, the name of the town, but he brought a bunch of his leaders to the meeting, Robert Wright, Robert and Judy, and then when they went home the next day, this is a little side thing, when they went home the next day, as the choir was singing a song by John Wimber called Come Holy Spirit, or let's see, Spirit of the Living God, song. No, he wrote it, and I can't think of the name of it right now. But as the choir is singing that, the Spirit fell in his First Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Church. The whole choir is knocked out. <laughs> He's so scared, he puts his head under the chair, the pastor. You could hear the wind, literally, like a mighty rushing wind, in the church. And the church service went until the mid-afternoon. And within a few weeks, every miracle, including raising the dead, that you could see in the New Testament had happened in that Advanced First Baptist Church of Advance, Missouri. Donna Heinrich and her husband were either Campus Crusade for Christ, full-time missionaries, or youth with a mission, not, no, said it wrong, or InterVarsity Fellowship, full-time. I forget which one. And um, they basically had not received a lot of fellow, a lot of welcoming <laughs> of the spirit in their organization, and and uh, so they'd helped start the two of the first vineyards in the Midwest. So back to the report now. Happy watched for some time. You got to know Happy. Happy is Mister Control. He's got everything figured down to the last second, and everything's got to be totally in his control. That's important for you to know. There's this history between Happy and I. Um, and when I was touched, the most powerful touch I ever had was when he blew on me at his church in 89. I thought I was going to die. And um, so Happy watched for some time. Then he approached me and said, I've received things from you in the past. Now I want this. I want to drink. I began to pray for him. I believe Robert, my associate, was praying with me also. Happy began to bow his body backwards and instead of falling, began to shuffle his feet. <laughs> backwards to keep from falling. This was not safe, for the floor was literally covered by the slain. And before we, we, be, before we would begin to pray for someone, we had to find a place to position them so that when they fell, they wouldn't fall upon someone. It was like falling trees. We told Happy not to walk out from under the Spirit's power to stand and fall, but not to back up, to keep from falling. We prayed again, and Happy fell under the power of God. A little bit later, about 10 or 15 minutes, Happy came up and said, I want another drink. <laughs> we prayed again for him, and he began to shuffle backwards again. We pushed him up. And prayed to continue and, and continue to pray a few seconds and happy fell on the floor. This time he began to double up with his knees to his chest and his feet sticking up in the air as he began to belly laugh. It was quite the sight. You couldn't help but laugh in the natural at what God was doing in our midst. It was funny because he's Mr. Control. <laughs> Never show any sign. <laughs> then I felt led to pray for happy again as he was laying, laughing on the floor. I knelt down beside him and prayed, God, take control of happy. He wants to control, and I ask that you take control of happy. When I prayed this, happy stopped belly laughing and quickly grabbed his shirt at his belly button area. He was gripping his shirt, and his hands were quenched 
I knew that this was a stronghold of the enemy in Happy's life. We prayed for the power of God to totally take Happy and for this stronghold to be broken down. Slowly, Happy's grip began to loosen. He began to relax his hands. Then I prayed, Lord, birth your work in Happy. This is breach. Turn it around and let it be born. <laughs> Very soon, there was a breakthrough in Happy. The joy and laughter returned. And he once again was laughing and enjoying the refreshment of the Holy Spirit. Happy came up to me again about 30 minutes later and asked for another drink. <laughs> I prayed for him. Now, this, he wasn't the only one doing it. Yeah. Most everybody's two, three, four. And every time they're getting more drunk. <laughs> came up to me 30 minutes later and asked for another drink. I prayed for him. And again, within seconds, he fell to the floor again, enjoying God's presence. When Fred Cullum, who it, with, with Fred Cullum, it was a little harder to make the initial breakthrough. He came up to me and said, you told me you wanted to pray for me, so here I am. I began to pray, but nothing was happening initially. I asked Bill Mares to come help me pray for Fred. And after a few min minutes, the power of God began to touch Fred. As Bill was with me and the work of the Spirit had commenced, I left Bill praying for Fred. I began to pray for the many others who were very much wanting prayer. The gift of faith was in our midst. Fred had fallen onto the floor, and Bill was over him. Bill was yelling. More, more, <laughs> and Fred was belly laughing. Now, when this meeting started, I'll tell you what it felt like. It felt like going into a funeral home to the viewing with the sense of death and a sense of discouragement and sadness. That's what it felt like before this prayer started. And that's the night before it, because I had been myself so dry, and I, and I knew that these guys had all helped start the churches the same time that I did, and we were all exhausted and burned out. And if God didn't come, I didn't know how any of us would keep on keeping on, as one of the old men used to say in my Baptist church, you got to keep on keeping on. And Fred was belly laughing and rolling on the floor. Fred couldn't stand anymore, and it was like Bill was teasing him by asking for more of the Holy Spirit to come upon him. Bill was laughing during this himself. Then Bill left Fred lying on the floor. Bill was across the room when Fred began to gain enough strength to rise from the floor. But as he was rising, his eyes and Bill's eyes connected. Bill pointed at him and yelled across the room at Fred, More! And Fred fell to the floor laughing. Later, Fred would lead us in singing some Pentecostal songs he had learned in the Jesus movement as people were laughing, singing, clapping, and dancing all over the place. It was the most fun party I have ever been to. Joel's place was certainly open for business. And the father had said, this drinks, the drinks are on me. John Raymer had been thoroughly thrashed by the Holy Spirit the night before. He testified later that he had shaken before in an evangelical manner, that being his legs shaking. But this was not a shaking. It was a thrashing. He shook his hand so fast that he threw his wristwatch off. He had fallen so fast and hard that he had sent chairs flying. His feet were flopping. And as we continued to pray, it began. he began to yell at the top of his lungs. He had been used as an object lesson by the Holy Spirit to birth faith in the people for the work that, which was to occur the following night, which is the night I'm writing about now. This had happened to him the night before. And by the way, Deanne was still uncomfortable with what had broken out in our church when I came back from Rodney. And she was uncomfortable. She told me, I don't think this is Vineyard. And I said, this is what the Vineyard was like when we signed up. It's not what it's been like lately, but it's what it was like when we signed up. This is, this is what it should be like. And she, and she, and she told me, I'm just wasn't convinced it's God. And when Happy told everybody to get in groups of three the night before and pray for each other, I didn't. And I just went, and I'm watching the crowd. And she said to me later, she said, I looked at you and I thought, who do you think you are? Why can't you just do what Happy said? That's what she's thinking. And because she's not sure this is God, even up to this night. And she's struggling with it. And uh, so then when I saw the power of God beginning to touch John Raymer, I went to him, prayed for him, and God, like, hit him. 
And he flew back from standing here to about where you're at. And he knocked a bunch of chairs over. And he's lying with his head up and lying on part of the chair. And his feet are in the floor. That's when he had thrown his wristwatch off. He's sweating. He's shaking violently. And then my wife said to herself, God is doing something with my husband. <laughs> so when we pray for him, he falls to the floor. He had fallen another time when he was helping to catch Happy. Happy fell so hard that John was knocked down. During all this curious order of God, which seems so fitting when moving with him, I received a word of knowledge about a right knee. I announced it and asked if anyone had the condition. John Raymer raised his hand. I went to him and began to pray for his leg. Instantly, his kneecap moved very noticeably. The Spirit of God hits John again, and his legs be uh, begins to tremble. As I'm praying, I feel impressed to pray for an anointing to come uh, to John in praying for the sick, or for him to have an anointing to pray for the sick. To my best recollection, he was the only person I prayed that for the whole night. It wasn't like I prayed that for everybody. It's too soon to know the fruit of this prayer, but I believe it was done under the anointing of God and will bear fruit. I asked the Lord to empower John again, and he fell to the floor. John was like, uh, John was not a gullible type person. He had been a successful businessman before entering the ministry a few years earlier. He had spent uh, time in Switzerland at Labrie with Francis Schaeffer. He graduated magna cum laude, straight A's, from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois. Shortly after praying for John, Judy Wright, remember Judy? Advanced Missouri First Baptist, came and told me she too had a problem with her right knee. I prayed for her, and she felt the power of God touching her. Later, she was dancing all over the place with some of the other women. She told me, and the women didn't dance in our meetings. This is all <laughs> it's spontaneous. Uh, later, she, okay, she told me the next morning that she felt the power of God in her knee most of the rest of the evening. Donna Heinrich had been prayed for and had fallen suddenly onto the floor. As I was walking by her, she began to stagger to her feet. By now, I was in a state of joy and silliness. <laughs> I walked by her and put my hand on her forehead and said, have another one. <laughs> Instantly, she fell to the floor and began to laugh again. No disrespect was intended, and it seemed totally in order with what God was doing. I had an understanding that God was throwing a party for his children. He wanted them to drink until they were intoxicated by the Holy Spirit and the joy of the Lord, <clears throat> which was to be their strength, was needed desperately in their, in their lives, and he was doing it. Thank you, Jesus. Four exclamation points. <laughs> the next morning, Don at breakfast was still under the influence to the point of being silly and smiling to the point of just being ready to laugh at everything. She was so happy. What a change in her countenance. The end had not come with a lot of expectancy. She, by personality, is much more skeptical of things than I am, and she has been a good balance to me. During the past few weeks, she had seen the Holy Spirit come and empower people, but because it was somewhat different in how he was doing it, she didn't know what to think. She told me that she had seen guys fall so quickly the night before that she knew God was truly doing something through us. This night, she told me that after the fact, she had felt during the worship the Holy Spirit's presence. This is really weird and neat. It's one of the greatest things that ever happened to her. She felt the Holy Spirit's presence coming toward her with her eyes closed, a tangible force. And when it hit her, when he hit her, she was literally picked up off her feet and then fell backwards to the concrete floor of any carpet. No one had been praying for her when this occurred. She cried and laughed and felt electricity coursing through her body. She is on the floor, unable to get up for at least 30 minutes, possibly close to an hour. And it really really affected her in a very redemptive way, as it did all of us. One other person comes to mind. As I was teaching, I'm almost done. I could see a deep desire upon the face of Ben Hare. That's Happy's brother-in-law. He was the executive pastor, and he too is a magna cum laude graduate of college. 
When Ben was prayed for, and who prayed for him, I don't know, he fell onto the floor. His feet were kicking, and his hands were like helicopter rotors. This lasted quite some time. I was so happy to see Ben touched again. He had been at the meetings at my Baptist church when I was first introduced to the ministry of the vineyard. He was at the Spillertown Baptist Church where Mike was at, that we called the Spillertown Massacre. <laughs> During all this time, the ministry time lasted for almost two hours. Not only was I ministering, but so were Bill and Robin Mayers and Robert Stovall, members of my staff. Robert was also prayed for since he had not gone with Bill and I to a meeting, which is Rodney Howard Brown meeting, that we were, we were powerfully touched by the Holy Spirit. The power of the Lord was with those guys, as with me. This meeting was a living, like living a dream. And then I, then I end it with a prayer. Lord, it is my prayer. Please do not let this anointing stop in my life. I present you my life to do as you choose. Let me be used. Your people are so thirsty. Let everything be done for God's glory in Jesus' name. Amen. That was October 27, 1993. Yeah. And what wasn't said in there, I didn't write it. I wished I would have. I'd probably go back and uh, add some notes to it, a couple of things. In the middle of everybody coming up to you, and it's like, here I am, and, and I've never had this before. There's about 70, 80, uh, all of our top leaders of the movement in the r Midwest region, and they're just coming towards you. And they're all just standing around, look, pray for me, pray for me, and just look, looking at me. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that moment, as clear as day. It was, it was so sober a statement that it was actually scary. And I've, I've told many people about this, but the Holy Spirit in that moment when everybody was looking at me, Randy, touch me. The Holy Spirit said, this is one of the most dangerous moments of your life. If you touch this and take credit for this, it will destroy your life. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was like the Lord said, they're not wanting you. They're wanting me. Don't get it confused. 